Any of, uh, any of y'all ever read David Foster Wallace? You know who David Foster Wallace is? Yeah, some of you guys know. He, he was an essayist. He wrote a bunch of essays. Um, he, read, he wrote a bunch of essays and wrote a book called Infinite Jest. And um, he has this really famous speech. The speech is called This is Water. And uh, in this speech, he says, you know, he tells the story. He said, there are these two young fish. These young fish are swimming along, and they happen to meet an old fish swimming their way. And the old fish looks to him and says, morning, boys, how's the water? Two young fish kind of look at each other confused. They just keep swimming along. And further down, after a while, one young fish turns to the other fish and says, what the heck is water? Right? The story is to prove that there are things that we live in all the time that we don't even realize that we're in. Right? Right? There are kind of subconscious things. There are things that are in our atmosphere. They're in our culture, right? We've just so acclimated to, we've become so numb to it that we don't even realize it's happening, right? We don't even realize what's going on around us. We get so used to kind of how things are that it's hard for us to see how they are, right? And I've found that to properly explain why we are planting mosaic and how we are planting a mosaic to anyone outside of Richardson, I have to first explain Richardson. I have to begin by explaining Richardson. And I don't know if you know the story of Richardson. So I want to tell you a little bit of the story of Richardson. I want to tell you what's going on in the life of our community. One of the coolest things as we have been uh, walking through this planting process has been um, connecting folks uh, and uh, getting to hear from folks Man, ever since we started talking about Mosaic or we jumped on the launch team, I'm seeing things in our community I hadn't seen before. I love that. And I think it's true because as we begin to look at our community, not as a place where we're just shuttling in and out of for work or in and out of for church or in and out of for recreation or in and out of for our social life, as we begin to see this community, not DFW at large as our city, not Dallas at large as our city, but Richardson as our city, we begin to look at it differently. We begin to look at it differently. I think that mission requires centripetal force. It requires centripetal force. It doesn't matter necessarily where you worship, right? But worship and the place where you gather for worship, it begins to give you a new set of eyes. So look around your community, right? It becomes an anchor point for mission. You begin to kind of circulate in your community in a different way, considering its stories, its narratives, its people differently. Because now you know that you will worship in their sight. Not away from here. Not somewhere else where they can't see you. But right here, in their community. You'll be a worshiper. You will be a believer. You'll be a participant in what God's doing in the life of this community. Let me just say it again on the front. And for those in the back, not for literally those in the back, but hashtag those in the back, right? (laughs) Mosaic Church is a church with a deliberately narrow vision. It is. It's a church with a deliberately narrow vision narrow vision. We are planting a church in Richardson for Richardson. There are a lot of great regional churches in the Metroplex, a lot of great regional churches, and we love them. And we're so grateful for those great regional churches. We will not be one of them. We will not be one of them. There are good, great regional churches, and we love them. I've served on staff and serve on staff at a great regional church, and I love it. They've been great, and I've blessed their ministry, and I'm so excited for what God's doing in and through them. But Mosaic is planting a local church right here in this community for Richardson. And as we pray, it's not that we don't hope that God won't do big things all around us. In Garland, in North Dallas, in Lake Highlands, in Addison, in South Plano, right? We want God to do all those big things in all those communities. But we don't think the best way to see God work in those communities is saying, why don't you leave those communities and come here? We think the best way is to send people to those communities to plant more churches, So we want to plant more churches and more churches and more churches. And maybe not just outside of Richardson, maybe some more churches right here in Richardson. But who is Richardson, right? I want you guys to take, let's go uh, lightning round, three minutes at your table. If an alien showed up, how would you describe the city of Richardson? So an alien shows up, describe the city of Richardson to an alien. Not DFW, not Texas, Richardson. All right? Three minutes at your table, go for it. How would you describe Richardson to an alien? You just, who's got one? Raise your hand, Kyle, I'll get the mic to you. New. Okay, what do you mean by that, though? I'll just repeat them. It'll be easier that way. Old but new. 
That's great. Older people, newer people, older homes, newer homes, older businesses, newer businesses. It's great. Yep, that's definitely a dynamic. What else? City in transition. Okay, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so there's transition. People moving out, people moving in. Yep, that's great. What else? Diverse. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Culturally, yeah. Okay. Property taxes. (laughs) Increasing property taxes. Um, okay, a diamond in the rough, a little gem. I like that. I like that. What else? First suburb, North, just right down the middle of the fairway. First suburb north of Dallas. <laughs> I, I appreciate that because mine says an entering first suburb of Dallas. So we think alike here. Um, okay, yeah, Melissa. Yeah. Built for families, invited the nations in, and kind of a dynamic of suburb and urban. Yeah. I heard somebody, uh, a city council member told me it's a little town next to a big town, um, which is kind of that suburban urban dynamic. What else? This is that's geographic. Let me repeat it for the record. Brian Plantis, this is the most Brian Plantis answer ever, <laughs> geographically subdivided into neighborhoods. Thank you, Brian. Um, those are all great answers, right? Those are all true. And it's much of what I'm about to share with you. So you're familiar a lot with what is going on in Richardson. It's an inner ring, first generation suburb of Dallas, right? Um, when you look at a kind of a quick history, R- Richardson in 1950 is roughly 1,300 people. Okay, so think about that. 1,300 people in 1950, okay? It experienced massive population growth from 1950 to 1972. Can anyone think of something that happened between 50 and 72 that might have spurred population growth in this way? What? Baby boomers? Okay, baby boomers. What else? Yeah, business is moving in. Yeah, business is moving in. Absolutely. So economy. What else? Yeah, yeah, TI and businesses and yes, that whole sector blew up, that's 1956, TI shows up. And they bring with them a ton of people. And they come out here because there's a ton of land for the people that work at TI to live close to TI. These are all good. You hit some of the big ones. You talked about baby boomers, of course. TI shows up. Maybe one that we forgot here is UT Dallas is established in the 60s. There are two big things that happen on, uh, before TI and after UT Dallas. Before TI, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education desegregation. And in 1971, which is when you look at our demographics, there is a huge jump from 1950 to 1972. The biggest jump is 70 to 72. Because in 1971, forced busing desegregation in Dallas ISD. Forced busing, right? You desegregate the schools and they say in 71, we're busing people, right? We're moving them around. So what happens? A bunch of people in Dallas go, no way They hop over 635, they can live close to Dallas, it's not that far in, and they've got a nice fence. They've got a nice fence right across 635. Right, so when you think about the history of our community, there's really good things that kind of fostered and cultivated growth here, and there's some dark things that fostered and cultivated growth here. We're now roughly a community of about 110, 115,000 people and we are looking to develop out to about 150,000 people, right? That's, that's where we're headed. Some of that comes as a result of UT Dallas, right? They're expanding, their, their prominence is growing, they're building more and more on campus, student housing. I don't know that you know how much property UT Dallas owns. It's substantial, and a lot of it's undeveloped, okay? And they're putting a lot of residential units over there. You can see where they're building kind of that northwest quadrant of Richardson above like the... Um, the Home Depot off of Coit, whole new divisions out there. There will be Plano schools. I think it's a Richardson Zip and they're Dallas. I mean, it's one of those, you know, crazy intersections of four different communities. City line development certainly has begun to change things. About 12,000 people living and working at the city line development with the plans of the next three to four years to develop it out to 30,000 people living and working in the city line development. So we're about 110 to 150, 115,000 people looking to develop out to about 150,000 people. 
Our community is about 58% Caucasian. I'm sorry, 53% Caucasian. The slide's wrong. 16% Hispanic, 16% Asian, 10% black. That's our community. Just from like a real quick demographics. Languages in Richardson, the top four languages. Anybody want to guess them in order? What's the first one? English. What's the second one? What's the third one? Chinese, broadly, right? Grouped in. Um, but, and then the fourth one? Vietnamese. Fifth is Arabic. And so Richardson is incredibly diverse. Um, and uh, when, you, when you begin to break up these numbers even more, Richardson can almost be broken down like this. Richardson is about 58% Caucasian and roughly 42% first or second generation immigrant. So our population outside of the Caucasian population, if you meet somebody who is Hispanic, Asian, or black in Richardson, there is a very high likelihood you're speaking to a first or a second generation immigrant. Uh, I have a friend named Nabiye Kalile, and he's planting out of a giant Ethiopian Eritrean church in Garland and the west side of central Garland, rough east side of Richardson. They're going to just kind of float on that border a little bit. And Neb was telling me, he was like, Kyle, you think when you meet a black person in Richardson that they're like typically a black American. Most of the time, you're meeting somebody who is not from America or they're a second generation immigrant here, right? Now, there are certainly exceptions to that. Right, they're outliers in every single one of these categories. But this is Richardson. This is Richardson. What's happening right now in Richardson? Well, you guys named a lot. It's growing. UT Dallas is gaining in prominence. They're building. They're developing. There's economic development that's coming in. It will change the topography of this community. Just City Line alone is going to change the way that Richardson feels, the vibe that it has. City Line is kind of broadcast as the place where you should be able to live, work, and play without a car. It's a place where you could stay there, and it's a place of growing singles community in Richardson, but also it has become the hub of the LGBTQ community in Richardson, right? Which makes sense. State Farm is relocated there. There are people moving from all over the country that are not from the South at large to work in an industry here in Richardson, and that are living at City Line because of its proximity to work. So there's some really interesting things. Richardson is changing. Churches in Richardson. What's church life in Richardson? It's very unique right now. Whenever we were looking to plant a mosaic, we began to meet with pastors. And I met with roughly 30 pastors as we were kind of considering what it would look like to plant a church in Richardson. And I was incredibly encouraged by many of those meetings. But the state of the church in Richardson is incredibly unique. In that old new dynamic that Nick mentioned, that is very much happening in the life of our community right now. Many of the churches that you drive past that have buildings, you know, the small churches you see on blocks of corners, they are in a moment of transition and they're very aware of it. Many of them have congregations where the majority of their congregation is over the age of 60 or 70. They're aware of that. They know what that means for the future life of their church and they're concerned about it, right? There are churches in Richardson that in the next two to three years will fold. Roughly 4,000 churches in America every year shut their doors, right? That's, cr that's crazy. It's crazy. And so as we begin to think and pray through what's going on in the life of our community, there is a lot that's happening. Economic development, people are moving in, people are moving out, the community is changing, churches are going through transition. We've begun to be able to be some, we've been, been able to develop some partnerships and some collaborators. And I just think it would be good to note them so that you would know who they are. Um, Sam is actually in the back. Sam, would you just stand and wave? Can we thank Sam? He's the pastor here at Loft. We got to pray over Sam at a prayer night, but he's been so kind to me. But this is Loft Community Church. They've been a good friend to us and a partner with us, and we look to partner and collaborate with them for mission in the life of our community in the future. Uh, Loft is a multicultural church plant that started roughly four years ago, Sam. Am I telling the story right? Six years ago. Um, and so, and they've, they've been here for the duration of that time. Um, and so that, that's what's going on here. They're gospel preaching. They love the Lord. They're looking to make disciples. And um, uh, they're just, they've been a delight to get to know. Then there's Northridge Baptist. That's where we've been meeting for prayer. Northridge is one of those churches in transition. Pastor Tucker is trying to navigate in a, a congregation that is uh, on the on the tail end of their life cycle as a church to think about what might be next, what might be new. But they preach the gospel. They love the Lord. They're considering what God is doing in this community. Benary Presbyterian Church, there's, uh, the young adults, English-speaking pastor there, K.J. Ahn, 
uh, is the uh, second-gen pastor at Benary Presbyterian. It's a Korean church in Southeast Richardson that we've been able to get to know and start dreaming about what God might do here. And then Nabiye Kalile, who's planting Pathways Church in Far East Richardson, West Garland. Um, and so as we begin to, I just want you to know, those churches are out there. We love them. We're grateful for them. And we're talking about collaboration. Then there are legacy churches in Richardson. Those churches are still as big and as strong as they've ever been. It's First Baptist and First United Methodist and Heights and Wood Creek Community. Community churches. These are church, churches that have been in the community for 30, 40, 50, 60. Uh, I think for First Baptist and First United, it goes way past that. For decades in the life of this community, ministering the gospel, trying to be goodwill ambassadors in the life of the community. So there's legacy churches that are kind of consolidating strength. There's older churches uh, that are kind of in a hard season. Um, and then there are new churches. There are church plants like Loft or Pathways or Mosaic. Chase Oaks is starting a campus in Richardson. So there's new works, there's old works, there's strong works, there's weak works, there's legacy churches, there's brand new baby churches. There's a lot that's going on in Richardson in the next two to three years. It will be very interesting to see how all of that shakes out. And so that's a little bit of the lay of the land of who is Richardson and what's going on. But who is Mosaic, right? right? Who are we in the midst of all of this? Well, this is our mission statement. And you're going to hear me say this a billion times over the duration of your involvement with Mosaic. We are a gospel-centered family of disciple makers. That's why we started session one, who is God and what is he doing? Because the gospel is where we start. It's the thing that centers us and balances us and anchors us as we consider what God is doing in the world. It's a uh, it's the good news that gives us a reason to live as a family and to make disciples. Apart from the gospel, there isn't a reason for family. There's no engine for it. And disciple making would have really no goal to it. But the good news is what fuels our love and affection for one another and our love for the world. And this gospel, we think, creates family. It creates brothers and sisters from strangers, right? In this process, you're getting to know people, maybe even tonight, at your table, that you've never met. But if they are a believer, you are closer to them than any non-Christian friend you've had for decades in your life, right? You are a brother and sister in Christ. Because of your mutual union to Jesus, you too share something that is indescribably unique between the two of you, this mutual union to Jesus Christ. And this should create in us a spirit of brotherly and sisterly affection. This should create in us a willingness to love one another, to care for one another, to serve one another, to pray for one another, right? And then it births disciple-making. Because we're a family, but we're a family with a purpose. What's that purpose? To make disciples. Who is a disciple? Who is a disciple? Write this down. A disciple is one who is learning to worship Jesus, to be changed by Jesus, to obey Jesus' commands, to proclaim Jesus with other disciples. I'll repeat it again. One who is learning to worship Jesus, be changed by Jesus, obey Jesus, and to proclaim Jesus with other disciples. Tomorrow, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about disciple making, but I wanted you to have that tonight. What are the values of Mosaic? We talk about them in three ways. At Mosaic, we want to grow together, we want to give together. We want to go together. We want to grow together. We want to learn what it is to worship Jesus, be changed by Jesus, follow and obey Jesus, and proclaim Jesus. We want to grow together. We want to know more about who God is and what he is doing and how we can respond. We want to learn more about ourselves. We want to learn who we are because we can only see ourselves as uh, as, as we truly are when we see God as he truly is. So we want to grow together. This, th this can't happen alone. That's why all of the togethers are there, because of the redundancy of it. It's for purpose. It's that we need one another. We need to grow adequately. We need to grow together. We need to give together, which means we're going to sacrifice. We're going to serve. We're going to care. We're going to be generous. We're going to be hospitable. Why? Because we believe the gospel compels that for one another and for the world. So we grow together, we give together, and we go together. We live as a sent people in this world. We are sent out as people to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So we grow together, we give together, we go together. So that's a little bit about who Richardson is, who Mosaic is, but we need to also talk about why plant a church at all? Why is Mosaic? Aren't there churches in Richardson? That's what everybody has asked me, right? Aren't there enough churches in Richardson? right? Or in DFW. Why plant another church 
in Richardson. So let's talk about it. Tim Keller says this, new churches are city climate changers. And I can tell you, having been involved with church planning in the past, the church I came, at, came from before I was working at the village and then being at the village, this is true. New churches change the climate of a city because it reinvigorates a whole group of people to look at the city differently. It just changes the climate. It changes your neighborhoods. It changes how people are thinking about where they're living and why they're living there. They're city climate changers. But why are we planting mosaic at all? Outside of it just could change the climate of the city. Well, a couple of reasons. One, it's faithful to the biblical mandate. It's faithful to the mandate to go there for and make disciples. It's faithful to the New Testament model that we see of Paul and the apostles planting churches that then planted more churches, that then planted more churches. It's faithful to the New Testament model of planting churches that plant churches. We think this is the way that God has set the New Testament church up to to be a part of what he's doing in the world, to be a part of the mission of God. It's faithful to God's word. It's faithful to the biblical mandate. It's also faithful to the Great Commission. New churches, uh, new residents, excuse me, new residents in a community are almost always reached by new congregations. New residents in a community, I could, I could send you reams of data on this, but new residents in a community are almost always reached by new churches. And what does Richardson have a lot of right now? New residents. New residents. New churches are more nimble, they're more agile, and they're more aware of the opportunity. They haven't take, taken on loads of institutional burden, and so they're a little bit more quick on their feet. They can respond a, with a little bit more agility. They can step in a little bit faster. They can, uh, they can kind of respond a little bit quicker. And because of that, new residents are almost always reached by new congregations. And new churches are the best kind of reach into the unreached people and the unchurched people in our communities. They are. They are. Uh, they, I guess they cannot be if you structure them poorly, Right? But if the hope is to reach people, the new churches are the best reach into the unchurched. It also helps renew existing congregations. It, it begins to raise questions among existing congregations about what are we doing. New churches bring new ideas. They serve as creative and strong leaders for the whole body and the life of the community. They lead other churches to self-examination. And it's an evangelistic feeder for the whole community. I have no doubt that we will see people come to know the Lord through the ministry of Mosaic, through the ministry of your life or your gospel community, um, and that that person will not be at Mosaic a year from then. They'll be at another church, and they'll go into that church, and not because we want them to, but just because that's the way things, that are, way things are. And they'll join another church, and they'll be able to help and support and bring evangelistic fervor to that church. That's not a bad thing. It's going to happen, and we're delighted that the churches in Richardson would be strengthened by our ministry as we're strengthened by their ministry. Why plant a church in the same city as other churches that you're a part of, like TVC, like Loft? When I met with Sam the first time, I asked Sam, you know, this is about probably almost a year ago. I asked Sam, I said, Sam, does Richardson need another church plant? He said, no. I thought, man. That's a real bummer because <laughs> I'm planning a church there. Um, uh, and he said, no. He says, it needs 12 more church plants. It's 12 more church plants. We need more churches than we think we do, right? I thought I had the data here. I don't. Let me give it to you real quick. One church per 10,000 residents, about 1% of the population of that community will attend church. If you have one church per 10,000 residents, about 1%. Just this is how the way that missiologists, the people who study these movements have seen this play out. One church per 10,000 residents, about 1% will attend church. One church per 1,000 residents, about 15 to 20% of that community will attend church. Okay, so one church per 1,000 residents, about 15 to 20% will attend church. One church per 500, over 40% will be attending church. And not that attending church is the end-all, be-all, but it is a sign of spiritual life and vibrancy. Okay, so it's just a marker. One church per 500 people, over 40% will attend church. There are roughly 80 registered churches in Richardson, but using a rubric not designed by us, but we call a basic church health rubric, which means faithful to historic Christian belief. That means that, they, that what they preach and believe, right, is something very, like it's, it's close to the gospel, right? Like it's, it's a true presentation. It may not have all of the distinctives, right? But it is true to the Christian story and a healthy governance structure, meaning that they have some kind of leadership there and that leadership is trying to keep them in the right direction. Only 27 of the 80 registered churches pass that rubric. 
27 of the 80 churches in Richardson pass through that filter. That puts Richardson at a ratio of one church per every 4,800 people. We need more churches than we think we do. Way more churches than we think we do. We don't simply need more churches, though we need more churches. We also need different churches. It's why early on with Sam, when I met Sam, or when I met uh, Brent in Northridge or Neb at Pathway, I was so encouraged by what they were doing, and it raised the question, should we even plan at all? When I asked Sam, Sam said this. This is a quote from him. I wish he was still in the room. He said, we, don't need more, we just don't need more churches, though we need more churches. We need different churches. We need different churches. We might plant different churches. Churches that don't look like us, that don't feel like us. We might plant different churches. Why? Because it increases the overall health of the church community in the life of a city. Still centered on the gospel, still looking to make disciples, but maybe exploring that in ways that we wouldn't or in ways that are different for the context they're in. There was a new study that was put out a couple of days ago by Lifeway, and it says this, we are planting 4,000 churches in America each year, but we are closing 3,700, right? We're closing 3,700. Richardson is not immune to this. So if you just said from a net perspective, we're planting 300 churches a year in America, that is not even close with keeping pace, with a cumulative need in the life of our country. This is not a season where we need to be planting less churches. It's a season where we should be doubling down. We should be planting more and more and more and more churches because in a time of spiritual apathy, we need more churches that are highly motivated, that have the gospel as the center to go into communities deliberately and on purpose to see men and women encounter Jesus Christ. The future of the gospel mission in the West is not throwing hand grenades or a magnet model of ministry where you say, hey, come look at all the great stuff we have over here. Nobody cares anymore. Nobody's interested in it. They've lost the appetite. They've lost the palate. And like we've talked about, there's no more cultural capital for it. It's not good or cool to be a part of a church any longer. Magnet ministry models are gone. And grenade ministry models never worked. The way that the gospel moves forward in the life of the global West today is at this level, the level of neighbor horizontally. It's knocking on doors and opening up dinner tables. That's the way the gospel moves forward in the life of a community like ours. It's been that way for a long time. We're just now starting to feel it. And every church is feeling this. I work at one of the largest and most successful churches in the country, and we are rolling off our campuses because we are not seeing disciple making in our communities in the way that we hoped we would. Because magnet ministry models and grenade ministry models, they don't work. They don't work. Our people have been immunized, inoculated, to the gospel. We have to go back into these communities at the level of neighbor and remind them of the sheer surprise and good news of the grace of Jesus. Last thing here, and then we're going to read that together, and then a little bit of time for Q&A. Hear me, Mosaic Church highest success metric will not be what we keep, but by what we send. That is our, that is our defining success metric. Not what we keep, but what we send. What do we give away? How do we train and release and train and release? This means that I want us to dream that we might see so much life transformation and leadership development that we may see another one, two, three, four churches planted through Mosaic. And not just somewhere else. Oh, that'd be great. But maybe even right here. Could we dream big enough that we would see so many people encounter Jesus Christ and be changed by him that Richardson would need 20 more churches planted here? Would we dream that kind of dream about what God could do here? Why wouldn't we? When I think about City Line, what if we begin to dream about seeing a church planted in and for the city development right now? Right now. What if we partnered with other churches in this community and said, let's put brand loyalty aside and let's begin to think about what God is doing in the life of our community and work together to plant more churches here? What if we begin praying about seeing a Muslim background believer baptized and sent back to a country of origin as an indigenous church planner from day one? No six months to learn the language, no cultural acclimation, no questions about sustainability in that environment. You, we could see that in Richardson. What if we prayed about seeing a Chinese or Vietnamese native speaker, somebody who knows the mother tongue but is a second generation leader, going back into China, going back into Vietnam, very hard countries, very rocky soil, as church planting missionaries in those countries. Richardson is the community that could see not just transformation here, but transformation here that sends transformation all over the country, all over the world. We can see that in our community. We can see that in this city. We don't have to go outside of the boundaries for that. There is enough work for us to do right here. 
And I'm believing and praying for a disciple-making movement in the life of this community, and I don't know that there's ever been a community more poised for a disciple-making movement than Richardson. And we get to be a part of that. Because why? Because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because his love is a delighting love. Because we are his sons and daughters. And because he's a missionary God who has sent the Son and the Spirit to fill and indwell his people with the good news of Jesus to proclaim it. Because we have learned to share and celebrate what we worship. Wouldn't that be a dream that we could dream together? And it's going to be costly. It's going to be so sacrificial. Blood, sweat, and tears. But that's the pathway to joy. It always has been, it is now, and it always will be. And so tomorrow, we're going to talk a lot about rhythm and strategy. And we're going to talk a lot about sacrifices. But we couldn't talk about any of that stuff until we talked about who God is, what he's doing and how we are to respond, and where we're at. That we start looking at this community, not just as a place where we shuttle in and out of, or we just kind of exist for the moment, but as a place where we're putting down roots here. And we're saying, God, whatever you do to this community, I'm going to be there. Whatever you do in this city, I'm going to be there. When I prayer walk around this community, I say, God, if you want to destroy this city, you're destroying me. If you want this city to flourish, I'm going to be right there with you, right? For better or for worse, we're in this community. And as long as we're in this community, I want us to be full bore here, praying that God would do something big from here that would stretch to the Metroplex, to other pockets of Richardson, to the rest of our country, and to the world. And I think we can see that.